Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for taking the time to uh, join us here this morning. And hopefully this time that we share together is time well spent. Let me push this up. I know how to rock microphones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank South by Southwest, you know, for uh, inviting me down this year to come and speak and share with the, their film community some things that inspired me and what film means to me. And uh, I think I'll point out some things that uh, help those who are aspiring to enter this arena. Uh, I think some information here may be very useful for you. When you think about films, uh, I'll reflect back to uh, my first film that I ever saw. The first time that I went to a movie theater, my uncle took me and my two older brothers, and we saw the movie Star Wars. What a great start, right? <laughs> and as we uh, saw this film, you know, I think my favorite character at that time was Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, <laughs> deep spiritual guy. Um, and then the second film that he took us to see was called The Swarm. Uh, Michael Caine was about a bunch of killer bees taking over a town. And then the third film uh, we wound up going to see was at a grindhouse theater. It was a double feature called Fury of the Dragon, which is a Bruce Lee movie that's actually a bunch of green hornet clips cut together to make a movie. And the double feature was Fury of the Dragon and Black Samurai, starring Jim Kelly. Now, I'm hooked, all right? Now the funny thing about film is that film has an amazing power to affect our subconscious, and I think I'm a living proof of that. When you think about images flickering at 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second, that comes out to maybe about a hundred, no, about a thousand, 440 at 24, and about 1800 frames per minute. And over the course of a film, let's say you got a 100 minute film and you get 180,000 images that has, that has gone by your brain. And your brain absorbs this and it goes into a subconscious. Now they say a picture could say a thousand words. So imagine how many words come into your mind with all these images. And as years go, went on for me, when I think back of what my artistic expression has become, uh, forming a band called the Wu-Tang Clan, you'll notice that uh, those early films are my music. If you look at the swarm, <laughs> and the Wu-Tang is called the Killer Bees, you can see there was a subconsciousness of that film that got embedded in me. When you look at Star Wars or the martial art films, you know, the, the sword swinging, the lightsaber swinging, and Wu-Tang being a sword style of, uh, of lyricism, you see that all these different films has guided me, informed me, uh, molded me, and helped me find my artistic expression through music that was founded on film. Now, we all have an artistic expression inside of us. That's my, that's my strong belief. And I believe that uh, the artistic expression is actually a wavelength. It's like a wave of energy, like light is a wave, sound is a wave. I think art is a wave. And I think that when someone is able to catch that wave, they can express their art through any medium. So the artistic expression that was coming from film affects me, but yet comes out through my music. And the coolest thing about it for me was that it was subconscious. Let me give a little bit of science for a second here, right? Let's think about subconscious, and let's think about the power of, uh, of energy and dimensions. 
the great scientist Einstein figured out that E equal MC squared, meaning that light surpasses time because light is a wave which is an energy. But after energy comes subconscious. Subconscious surpasses light. This is what quantum physics is all about. So something that's in your subconscious, in your dreams, for instance, you know, you ever have a dream where you're one place, then you turn a corner and you're back five years ago, then you go this way and you're 10 years over there. That's because in the subconscious, time doesn't exist, nor does energy govern you. And then all that has to come to the consciousness. And that materialized for us right here in our physical three dimensions. And on film, of course, two dimensions. But the point, of the, the point of the subject is that when something goes into you, it matures itself and it comes out of you. And I was able to recognize that later on in my career. But as I was doing Wu-Tang, I didn't really recognize that. It was more like just ideas popping and popping and popping. And uh, it took me some time to go back and reflect like, wow, that actually came from the seed that was planted from my uncle taking me to see films or from my aunt taking me to see films or for the many, many days which I cut and played hooky and went to watch Kung Fu movies. Uh, in my day in uh, New York, we had uh, uh, Times Square called 42nd Street or we called it the Deuce. You know? And we used to cut, I mean, me and ODB would cut class, uh, ring up a dollar fifty, go to one of these theaters, the Lyric Theater was one of my favorites, and uh, you couldn't get in because you had to be 17 or older, right? So that means you got to stand there, ask an adult to buy your ticket to go inside. And we would go inside and it'd be a triple feature, something like Five Deadly Venoms and Executioners from Shaolin with the Mac, right? <laughs> and uh, and you'll be sitting beside, in those days, guys sniffing glue, <laughs> some guy over here smoking weed, some guy just trying to fund his girlfriend and get, you know, get his rocks off. And here go two 13, 14-year-old kids just watching movies, escaping our reality, and finding an alternate reality. Uh, that's one of the other powers of film is that it can allow you to escape your reality. Uh, for men like myself growing up um, in a poverty situation, 11 brothers and sisters and, you know, all the negative elements that was around me, you know, to think I could go and watch a movie that takes me back, you know, 1,500 years to China or to a place, a galaxy far, far beyond, <laughs> right? It, it has some magic to it and, it, and it actually helped me as, a, as an individual, you know, and that was my way, of, that was my therapy. And I think film still serves as this therapy to a lot of us, uh, those who enjoy watching it. But then there's also those who are striving and enjoying to make it. When I finally had uh, figured out what I wanted to do, which was be a hip hop artist and make music, I started making albums that reflected my idea of what a film would be. Let me get this off here. Yeah, yeah, yo. Uh, my first album was called into the 36 Chambers, Wu-Tang Clan. And uh, my idea actually was to make a audio film. And this is 1993, DVDs is not on the market yet, you know? And I thought that I could make a movie with my music. And I felt that I succeeded and I tried it again with a, another album called To Cal, and we went on to do uh, Old Dirty Bastard and Liquid Swords, and 
only built for Cuban links. And to me, each one of these albums or CDs were my way of making a movie. Now, the coolest thing happened to me. Uh, on 36 Chambers, there's a, there's a uh, skit that says, hey, yo, yo, where's my killer tape, man? Where's my killer tape? And you hear uh, Method Man and Raekwon argue over about this killer tape. Now, the tape we were talking about was the VHS tape, The Killer, by John Woo. All right? And that film was like a big sensation for us. And so by the time we got to the album Only Built for Cuban Links, I managed to manipulate my VCR to plug it up to my sampler. And I sampled parts of The Killer and used that as the theme to the album Only Built for Cuban Links. And to me, that record was about two guys about to do their last big crime spree, calling some of their buddies, make about $1.2 million, and then quit the business, all right? But the album did sell a million copies, so we made the money, all right? But we didn't quit the business. But what happened, though, was uh, because I sampled this movie and was such a fan, such a fan of John Woo, a record executive, uh, my, uh, who's my friend Sophia Chang, told me to write a letter to John, you know, and explain, you know, that we sampled his work. You know, I didn't want to get sued, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and also to tell him how much we admired the other movies he was done. You know, Bullet in the Head, which is one of my favorite, of course. To Catch a Thief, you know, God's a Gambler, all these child young fat movies he did. But John responded to the letter. He responded. And now during those days, I was known to be late. Like the RZA, if you read the Source magazine, it says RZA, cool guy, smart, intelligent, notorious for being late. All right? And so John invites me to this restaurant to meet. And uh, I think dinner was slated at 6 p.m. And I showed up when the restaurant was closed. <laughs> but John, such a gentleman, such a unique individual, he held the restaurant open for me. He actually had a desire to meet me as well. And we met and we had the greatest dim sun and a great time, him and his partner Terrence. And uh, he became a friend of mine and we, you know, I, I talked to him a lot about films, <clears throat> filmmaking and how he did what he did. And there was one film he had in particular called uh, A Bullet in the Head which I said one day if I ever could make a movie, I want to make this movie over. And I said, John, can I get the rights to this movie? And he explained to me, no, this movie was, uh, you know, at Hong Kong property and I wouldn't be able to do it. But actually, RZA, I'm glad my movie inspired you, but I was also inspired by a movie when I wrote that one. I'm like, huh? What? What? What are you talking? You? You? Were, at this time, I couldn't imagine that a director could be inspired by other sources because, in a way, directors are samplers in their own way. You know, the film is their medium of sampling. Like I use a sampler to sample beats and to sample old songs and to sample movie clips. They use film in their minds to sample ideas. This is why we could have somebody like Kurosawa who, who uh. Maybe two million people seen his movies, but at the end of the day, 50 million people saw it when they watched Star Wars. So this is the power of film. But John said to me, he said, well, I can't give you the rights to it, but why don't you just go watch Mean Streets? Okay, just go watch Mean Streets and you'll be inspired and you'll figure it out yourself. And, uh, I did, of course, watch Main Streets. <laughs> and John um, became the first person in the world of film that took the time to share his wisdom with me and uh, inspired me to create my art. And it, and, and it actually had, had me leading into a different direction. Um, I started recognizing music as not being two bars and four bar phrases and start looking towards the 16-bar phrase and 20-bar phrase. 
Now, of course, that was useless for hip hop because we like boom, boom, pat, boom, 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 pat. All this movement of music and, you know, orchestrating of music was not popular at that time. I mean, the guys in Wu-Tang Clan was like, yo, I don't know about that beat, yo, I don't like that no more. You know, that wasn't working for me. And so I realized that I was headed to a new direction as an artist. And ironically, uh, that started from 1995. Ironically, in 1998, I meet the next man who would help inspire me in the film business by the name of Jim Jarmusch. Jim, yeah, he deserves some applause because uh, um, a, a very smart man, you know, made many independent films. There was a film he made called Dead Man starring Johnny Depp that I watched and, uh, and that was the one that got me um, into his style of filmmaking. Now, I hope Jim don't get mad as I tell this story, but um, he, was, he, has, he was writing a new script for a movie called Ghost Dog. And he thought to himself that Forrest Whitaker would be the lead actor and the RZA would be the film composer. But he couldn't, he couldn't find the RZA. He didn't know how to find me. There was a guy who knew us both. He was our guy who we bought weed off of. <laughs> and, so, and so he was like, oh, RZA? Yeah, Jim, I know, know RZA. <laughs> and this guy brings Jim to my office, all right? <laughs> and uh, we met, and of course, we smoked one. <laughs> and uh, he tells me about, you know, his film and his idea, and he hooked up with, he brought Forrest in, and we all sat in. Jim was like, I want you to be the composer. Forrest is going to be the lead actor. I'm going to go off, and I'm going to finish writing the script, and in the 90 days, we're going to start. And I was like, wow, a film composer. That's crazy because my music is starting to move towards a more uh, classical form. And this comes because I watch films. You know, I, I hear what uh, Sergio is doing and, uh, and uh, Maricone is doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious. I was very conscious of what Bill Conti was doing, you know, the fifth film that I ever saw in my life was Rocky, and, it, and it, I just love uh, the score to that film. But anyway, so Jim hires me, but the catch 22 is I never scored the film. I don't know the process, and, and Jim had to like meet me late nights at midnight in my, in my pimped out Wu-Tang van. I'm just giving the music, like, yo, check out this one. I just wrote this one, yo. And he had to actually take it in and try to cut it into the film itself because I didn't have the equipment, but I was writing. I, wrote, I started writing the music to the screenplay at first, and then I, I had a rough cut, and I would just hit record on the, I mean, rewind on the VHS and play the music and hit rewind and play it and go, yeah, this will work, and then hand him a dat full of, uh, of music. He recalls the story like, yeah, it was like I was meeting Rizzo on some secret mission at night. He called me up and said, meet me here on 42nd and 3rd. And, and he gives me this thing of dust. And hey, and him and ODB have 40 ounces in their hands. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the film got done. <laughs> the music got done. And it was my first uh, step into the world of Hollywood or filmmaking. It was, it was my, my first foot in the door. And Jim thought it would be cool to even have me do a cameo in the film, which, uh, which was very different for me. You know, when you do hip hop videos, everything is to the camera, yo, yeah, yo. But in film, you have to put that fourth wall there and you can't break it. So it was a different mindset for me. And uh, he gave me that shot. We did get some critical success with Ghost Dog. Uh, we sold a lot of records as well. And then uh, that led me to get the attention of a gentleman in the movie business known as Harvey Weinstein. And Harvey had bought a film, him and his partner, called Iron Monkey. And they wanted to bring it to uh, America and show it in some New York theaters. And they reached out to me and asked me would I hold some private screenings, uh, being that Wu-Tang Clan had such a great uh, aesthetic with Asian cinema and hip hop and, and black culture. We was 
like the icons who could mix those cultures together. And I was like, oh, Harvey, yeah, I ain't monkey. I saw that 10 years ago. I would, I would love to do that, right? And so he set it up, and we gave some screenings. And uh, um, he said, okay, how about doing a press junket? <laughs> I said, cool, I could do a press junket. And, and, the, and, the, and the truth of the story is Harvey offered me a lot of money to do this. But being a lover of martial art films and film in general, I declined the money. I just wanted to have lunch with him. And reason B is because me and my brother had started our company as two dreamers in New York City with just two turntables and a mixer, using the headphones for the microphone. And that went on to be the guys who built a, a multi-million dollar studio. And so I knew that Harvey and his brother had very humble beginnings and they went on to build their company. I just wanted to meet him and shake his hand. And he said, cool, that's a great deal. We can't beat that, right? <laughs> and so we met and we shook hands and he said, yo, uh, I want you to come to the press junket and, you know, and talk to the press about the film, you know, because I have so much knowledge of the film. And so we get to the press junket and here I am, it's the RZA. They flew in Donnie Yen, one of the greatest martial art guys of our generation, and Quentin Tarantino, who was his partner. And so we all sitting there and I meet Quentin for the first time and we're talking about Kung Fu films. And we're naming Kung Fu film after Kung Fu film. And we're naming all of Donnie Yen films, but Donnie don't know shit about the films. <laughs> like, he don't, he don't know the names of them. He don't remember. I'm like, Donnie, remember when you did? He don't know nothing about it, right? So now it's just a me and Tarantino conversation because Donnie don't know nothing, right? And, uh, and that led to uh, actually a friendship with Quentin. And um, we would just kind of watch movies together. The Miramax would let us use their screening room and we'd go and just watch old Kung Fu movies. And I think uh, in the year 2000, or 2000, 2001, he had finished his screenplay to Kill Bill. And he uh, invited me over and he gave me a copy actually. And I read it and it was like, wow, this is incredible. I mean. This guy, when he writes, he writes the action sequences on the script, okay? When you, when, you, when you saw the movie and it says the knife comes through the table and the table flips over and then there's a gun in a cereal box, that's written. And so you could actually read his script and visually see it at the same time. And I was so impressed with that, you know, you know I recall telling him, yo, Man, you got this is great. I mean, I can't wait to see it. But if you need any any help in any capacity, uh, um, let me know. And of course, he didn't. He didn't need any help. <laughs> but as we was hanging, he uh, one day he said, "Yo, the way you produce your albums is like a movie." And I always handle my own music, but it would be interesting if you produce my soundtrack and my score the way you produce your move, your, your, uh, your records. I said, oh yeah, that's, I could definitely do that. And so he said, cool, that's what's gonna happen. And, uh, and so in order to do that, um, it caused me to take a trip to China. Now when I got to China and Beijing, I remember coming to the set and I remember watching Quentin just do his magic, yo. And it hit me in my head like, yo, I'm proud of what I do, but wow, that felt like the ultimate expression of art. And I, you know, as a man, as a cool hip hop, tough motherfucker, man, <laughs> I humbled myself and I said, yo, Quentin, man, I would love to be your student. I would love to be, you know, your apprentice. I want to learn the process of making film. And he accepted me as a student. And so I uh, spent six years under his tutelage. Um, worked with, on Kill Bill 1 and 2, of course. Uh, just hung out here in Austin on Death Proof down at Troublemaker Studio, just there, just, oh, what's it doing here? Oh, he's just learning. <laughs> but uh, one of the coolest things that happened um, in this process was that when I would come to set in Beijing, he was shooting in, this, in a big uh, 
it's a big stage, but it had like a uh, kind of like stadium seatings as well. And you would, day by day, people would see me up, high up, looking down with a composition notebook. The same kind of notebook I used to write songs in. I'm writing down the six angles of filmmaking. Uh, you know, I'm watching the great DP um, Robert Johnson do do all this, do all this, Robert Robertson do all this magic um, with uh, with the cameras and all the different setups. I'm watching Uma take after take after take after take. I mean, man, this lady was doing the flip. Uh, oh, that was good, Uma. Uh, one more time. Do 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 Ah, that was good, Uma. One more time. <laughs> over and over, not complaining. No complaints. Everybody working. I'm seeing the synergy of this whole group of people, and I just was amazed by it. And I'm just writing all these notes down, and uh, that led to me wanting to really join the Hollywood world. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. The coolest thing, though, out of this process of see, some of us get a chance to go to school to learn how to make film, or we get books. Um. There's many ways you could be taught. Some of us, we just watch movies. If you're fortunate to get a good mentor or a good teacher to help you, yo, you know, that's like a kung fu guy. You could join a karate school or you could just get you a good teacher. And I think by having a good teacher, that kind of helped propel me and maybe I cut the line a little bit. Some of my peers were like, yo, how the hell you get uh, to do a film that quick, kid? <laughs> but, um, the greatest thing that happened to me on this journey was I was doing my film, The Man with the Iron Fist, and I'm in China again. And Quentin flies over, and he comes to the set, and we're sitting here at uh, Video Village with, you know, you got Eli Roth, uh, Mark Abraham, Russell Crowe, Lucy Liu, uh, Daniel Wu, Quentin Tantino, all at Video Village having a moment. And then Quentin kind of looks over to me and, or, or leans over to me and says, remember you was in Beijing here in China writing notes as a student? I said, yeah, man. I said, well, the student has now graduated, you know? And that was like, wow. That was uh, a crowning achievement for me because you think about a lot of us, sometimes we have to, you know, we spend thousands of dollars to go to school, which is good, you know. That's the best thing. If you could get a chance to go to school and to learn the craft, great. But if you're fortunate to get a good mentor, I advise you to take it. Take the wisdom. Use it. Sharpen yourself with it. Improve yourself with it. One thing that Tarantino also uh, schooled me on was when I would go to his house to watch films, I would notice in his library books and books on the subject of film. A lot of people who want to be an artist don't realize that you could get there by yourself. You could get anywhere you want to go to in this world by yourself, but it's easier with a map. Huh? And books are those maps. Things that other great people have done before you is the map that could guide you. Now, of course, it's not going to tell you, hey, Indiana Jones, a big boat is going to fall here or there's a trap door. That's when you have to get physical. That's when you're going to have to be on the ground. They say that a film is first written as a screenplay and then it's written again while you're filming it. And then you write it again in the editing room. And then when the studio see it, you're going to have to do it again anyway, right? Because <laughs> the studio is going to be like, well. <laughs> Actually, one funny thing happened to me. My first cut of my film was three hours. All right? We used over a million. It was digital, but they measured the equivalent of what I shot was over a million feet of film. All right? Imagine that, all right? The average movie is about four, 500,000. <laughs> The old Kung Fu movies, 200,000 feet. RZA went out and shot a million feet <laughs> of film. Lucky it was digital, right? But anyway, I come with a three-hour version of my film that kind of chronicles the, this whole story 
of some of the of 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 the, of the Chinese character I had, and uh, and we're in the studios watching it. Well, well, uh, you know, the first is interesting, but who's going to watch forty minutes of things we don't know and understand to get to where we need to be? I said, Bobby, you have you have to learn to streamline your story. That's what editing is about. And they made a, a slogan that you may have heard before. They said, you have to go back inside the editing room and kill your babies. Now, that's the hardest thing for any artist, whether you're a lyricist, whether you're a book writer, you know, because you think that what you're putting is, is, you know, it's a part of you. It's part of your DNA. It's part of the story you want to tell. But you're not telling it for yourself. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for an audience. You're doing it for someone who is going to sit here and watch those 30 frames per second float through their minds, and you have to keep their focus. It's hard to keep focus, keep people's focus. So you have to find a way to streamline it. And I, I didn't, I didn't want to hear that. I was pissed off. I left. Went home, complained, <laughs> smoked one, <laughs> and then uh, my producer was like, "Look, why don't you just take two weeks, clear your mind and relax, all right? And we'll we'll go in, and we'll do what we'll do, all right?" I was like, "All right, guys, go ahead." So and my producer is Eli Roth and Mark Abraham, and Eli is like a brother of mine. So, you know, I love the guy. Uh, you know, trust him with my life. Uh, should not have trusted him with the film, right? What I mean by that is that when I when they brought me back into the editing, they brought me back in to a 75-minute film from three hours to 75. And I didn't understand what the heck was this lesson about. I just remember panicking and flipping out. And then Eli was like, yo, okay, now you have a streamline. Now you fill it in. Now you fill it in. And uh, about a month later, after going through that process, I got to a place where I was comfortable, where that first 40 minutes was actually only three minutes of information. And I think it was like the final melding of myself because I had to get over what I was attached to. When you're making films, the biggest thing I could say is it's a collaborative piece of work. And when you are a director, a writer, a composer, an actor, producer, craft service, every person part plays an important role in the ultimate body of work. If the craft service lady don't make the food good and you're working, you're not going to work at your best. She brings over some soggy french fries. <laughs> you're like, yeah. The, you know, <laughs> every element of everybody's job is so important. And when you become a director, and uh, how, many, how many of us in here are striving to be directors? You're striving to be what I like to call Captain Kirk, all right? The, the captain of the enterprise. And it's like running a small country, yo. On my set, I had about 400 people, and I shot in China, so 300 didn't speak English. And, and, you know, you have to work out every problem. And there's going to be times when you're going to have to let go what's seemingly important to what's really important. And um, when we finished the film, it actually grew me as a man. And I can promise, promise any director in here that when you finish your film, you will grow as a person. It's like going through fire and being tested like gold in a furnace. I've, I've got 
three Ps, I like to say, right, that uh, that came out of um, me directing the film. Persistence. You must be persistent. Because persistence overcomes resistance. Persuasion. A director has to have the power of persuasion because you have to get a guy who was up 12 hours the day before to come back in and work 12 more hours and to be joyful, jovial, focused, skillful at his job. And sometimes this carries on for six straight days. Most people are away from their families. So your, 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 your power of persuasion, and not in a negative way. I don't mean coercing nobody. But just by having that understanding of the struggle they're going through is a struggle you're going through. But the strongest P that I could ever say I got from it is preparedness. You must be prepared. Everything about making a film is about preparing yourself. In fact, the great Buddha said, many people travel the path and fall off the path because they was not prepared for the path. Anything you do, if you get up in the morning, yo, you gotta go to work. The smart people got their clothes prepared the night before. <laughs> they like, oh, they get up. It's the, 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 the people who showed up late button up their shirt, yeah, you know what you did in the morning. You wasn't prepared. So that is a, a vital element of filmmaking. When we started our film, the producer was like, okay, Bobby, we're going to give you uh, 12 weeks of prepping, but you're going to really need about 14 weeks. So it'll be two weeks of pre-prepping, right? pre-pre-production, and then 12 weeks of of prepping, and I'm like, what, 12 weeks? Man, I had this idea in my head for seven years, man. I could do this in six weeks, let's go. I said, nah, would you, no, man, listen. Bobby, take the time. I promise you, it won't even be enough. I'm like, come on, man, you just trying to, oh, you want to stretch out the payment over? I started thinking it was economical. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yo, 12 weeks? And yo, he was 100% right. After the 12 weeks, we prepared for 14 weeks, actually, for just nine weeks of filming. So our preparation was almost twice as long as our actual work days. And the reason is this. I'm, I can share this with you. Because when you're filming, at minimum, it's 200 grand a day. Unless you got one of a small, even at a small budget, no matter what you do, the bulk of your budget goes when principal photography starts. If you make a mistake doing principal photography, the cost is, a, is, 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 it could damage your whole project, yeah? The, the, if something is not there when you need it, on the day of, that's, I mean, that's self-destruction. When, when my AD, who got on my nerve. I mean, I actually spoke about him to another director, and it was like, yeah, that guy gets on my fucking nerve, right? Because he is so meticulous. He would ask you the same question 20, 30 times. You want green flag, and you want yellow? Yeah, I want green and yellow. I told you that yesterday. Okay. And he'll keep coming back. But when it came time to shoot, and things looked a, a little panicky for me, I was like, man, do we have the right number of this and that? I said, yo, I, I need, he said, yeah, I know. They right there, I got every, everything I wanted, he had it prepared. All his persistence, all of his consistency, all of his irritating, all led to us having, we didn't miss not one day. You know what I mean? When I mean, when I mean by miss a day, and when you're making a film, if you miss a day, that means you got to make that day up. And, you know, the studios don't like that. You know what I mean? 
I almost missed one day because uh, we had a costume problem and and uh, you know, being the director, you know, I'm like, you know what? We can miss this day. I'll make it up tomorrow. And it was, and the producer looked at me like, oh, this dude is crazy. Uh, <laughs> so he calls the studio from China. He calls back, yo, and he's like, yo, and he comes back, yo, you can't miss a day. You got to lose a scene. And I was like, wow. Okay, I can't lose a scene. So I have to make up for the day. And what? And fortunately for me, I was fortunate. I was fortunate to have uh, one of the best actors in the world, uh, Mr. Russell Crowe, who was able to deliver to me, you know, two pages of dialogue in one day. So usually, you know, you get a, you know, you get a, if you get a page a day, you're doing good. He did two pages, perfect delivery in one day. And, and the day that we was, that we lost, he made up, he made up that day. But you don't want to be in those kind of situations like that. And the best way not to be in those situations is to be prepared. I mentioned earlier about the artist wavelength. I'm going to bring it back that subject. If you look at me and, you know, or yourself, don't look at me, huh? <laughs> but, you know, a guy who started off as a kid writing lyrics, you know, about girls with big breasts, right? To a guy who would go hang in the record stores and buy records and scratch them up, and even a guy that would try to write his name on walls and graffiti. All these was different expressions of art. It's a wavelength. This same guy went on and gets in front of a camera and he acts with different characters or composed the music for the film. To me, this is all the same wavelength. There was a point in my life when I could draw, when I could sit down at a table and I could just you know, draw something nice, something very pleasing to my eye. And I and I, I recall thinking about that. And one day I was talking to my mentor, Mr. Tarantino, and we was talking about different artistic expressions. And he said to me, wow, Bobby, that's crazy. When he was younger, he also had a moment when he used to draw. And it, it was only that moment. It was just, and he helped me, that made me realize what I was saying is that, you know what, art is a wavelength. You can express your art through any medium if you recognize it. So, you know, whether we're taking comic books, video games, music, film, all these are expressions of art. And if you zone in, you can express yourself th through it. I mean, the Wu-Tang Clan, we got our names from comics and movies. video games, Bobby Digital, huh? <laughs> and uh, it's just a wavelength, man. And I want, nobody, I want you to, if you walk away with anything from me today, know that, that you could take that same wave, that same music, and you could put it through any instrument. In our industry right now, uh, television is doing great. So, so there's other mediums, you know, Amazon, Netflix, there's so many outlets for our, for, our, for our craft, you know, even YouTube. So um, the only thing I think that's stopping any of, anybody from achieving their, their dream is themselves because technology has caught up to us. If you can imagine it, it can be created. Um, so keep that, keep that dream alive and keep film alive. What I want to do, uh, I think we're running short on time, and I want to... Um, I want to open the floor, actually. So if anybody got any questions directly or anything you think I could uh, answer for you, uh, let's take the moment to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to start with this gentleman right here. Number one, uh, thank you for your contribution to our consciousness because uh, it's changed a lot of us forever. You talked a lot about the seeds that were planted early on in your career, in your life. 
What are the seeds that are being planted right now for you? I think right now the seeds are coming from different books and, uh, and science. One thing uh, I, I try to strive to do is keep studying. Never stop studying. So, you know, go back to the point where I said that uh, there's maps, you know. So don't be shy to pick up a book on a subject that you're interested in. Some people have said, like, there's some people that say, yo, you know, use your own intuition. Art should be created from yourself. And there's, there's a truth in that. But at the same time, Einstein already figured out E equal MC squared. Let's move on to the next equation. Don't start there. So I just use, um, you know, I've been studying Woody Allen. How about that, all right? <laughs> because as a writer, I'm writing now. And so he's one of the greatest writers. Only a few writers have ever won the Oscar twice uh, for writing, Tarantino being in that circle as well. But I've been studying Woody, and you know, I try not to look at the girl <laughs> and <laughs> look, at, you know, look at his personal life. But uh, <laughs> he's written some great movies and some great characters, man. Great. Um, morning, Riza. Um, Good morning. Your talk really enjoyed it. Really inspirational. Um, I'm on my wavelength right now. Is um, I'm trying to make a map. I'm trying to look for maps. I'm working on a story that's important to me that I'm trying to express through a black exploitation kind of kung fu type movie. And I've been watching like Black Belt Jones, The Mac, of course. Um, um, a lot, a lot of different movies, and just to have the opportunity to ask you um, what kind of maps would you recommend for a filmmaker like me? Um, I'm also an editor, a baby killer, I guess, but what kind of films would you recommend um, for that kind of way for think right now? I think one of the coolest things, right, is when you watch a different film from another genre to help inspire your genre. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, I mean, there's a Scorsese scene that actually happens early in a black exploitation movie. And of course, when you watch a movie like Black Caesar, yeah. uh, Fred Wilson, he's copying off of what Coppola did. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to, like, if, if I was making a, a black exploitation movie, I would watch a film, you know, from the French. Because no matter what, the character has to have a magnetic attraction. Mm -hmm. You got to have the character with his attraction. And if you have that, you basically got the key. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I have a question. I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> I was like, that was, that was magic for a minute. She, her, lips wasn't, <laughs> her lips wasn't moving. It was like a kung fu movie, right? <laughs> Words coming, but the lips wasn't moving. Yeah. OK. Over here. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned how when you were making your first album, you wanted to make a movie, almost like an audio movie. So take, take, tell the story with the music. I wonder, what, how would you do it if you were to do it in 2015? And uh, um, what artists, like present day artists, you think are doing good in this interdisciplinary film, uh, music, other forms of art field? Well, nowadays, it, it will be a little easier because the music equipment and sampling and audio visual is really right on our laptops. If you think of somebody like Kendrick Lamar and his recent record. I think that was a great way he, sh he took us to his world, to his neighborhood, to his life, right through his album, right through his music. Yeah. You know, even great songwriters, one of the greatest songwriters alive is still Paul McCartney, right? And you ever notice that when he comes on the Grammy shows, you may have never heard the song before, but when you hear it, you immediately resonate with it. So there's a formula of, 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 of a character building from, from, you know, from his, as they call it, the hero's journey. A good songwriter includes that into their music as well. But I think there's a, the, opportunity to, the opportunity to make it now is, is, is ridiculous. I could, if I do it now, Man, it'd be crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, for, first of all, I just wanted to say I never thought I'd ever be in an opportunity like this at all. 
like real quick. It was around like 04, 05. I wasn't really into hip hop. And then I found my dad's copy of 36 Chambers. I listened to it. I was like, wow, where has this been all my life? Like seriously. And so I've been a long time listener for a while. Like I've pretty much had like a good amount of albums on repeat. And I just kind of wanted to ask, you combine like all these, like all these cultures together, like martial arts, hip hop, and you said like uh, you were influenced by a lot of films too. So I was kind of wondering like, at what point in your life did you decide to become like so, uh, so like open-minded and just wanted to grasp things, like devour them, like all your philosophies of like religion and everything? Well, I. Th- um, I'm mean, trying to make this short for you. I think like at first I I had the personality that everything was mine. I think every man may go through that at a period in his life. I don't know if it's a teenager or a young adult where everything you do, everything is always about you. But I realized later on that it's not only about me. And that if I want to even express myself, I, I should at least understand the next man. And I, don't, I can't. Rec- I think it happened in a in a in a in a situation. I was going through a uh, a dangerous situation, you know what I mean, tragedy. And uh, I just took two steps back, yo. And I started thinking how positivity outweighs negativity. And then I started looking for the positive resonance in other things. Hmm. So you say like. Like before, I would never sit there and watch uh, Yentu. It's a Barbra Streisand film called Yentu, which I made my daughter watch like a month ago. All right? (laughs) Now, why? Because I could now respect the culture. I could respect uh, the music writing. I I could respect the cinematography, the story. See, when you're young, you don't want your broccoli. You don't want your spinach. You know what I mean? You want the fried chicken, yo. Just give me three pieces of chicken, I'm good. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? But when when you, you as you get older and you realize that, you know what I mean, this world is a combination of all of us, you know what I mean? You I think it's wise to take time to understand each one of us. And that's I took that personal endeavor for myself to make sure I can understand my fellow man. All right. Appreciate it. Respect. Wu Tang. Okay. Good morning, Riza. My name is Charmaine, and I want to let you know I fell in love with hip hop back in the 70s, visiting my cousins in South Bronx at the at the block parties. So to hear your music come out, Wu Tang Clan, it was very refreshing to see what you all were doing with bringing back the street stories of our lives that when we didn't have a voice in the music. What I wanted to share with you is I'm from Chester, Pennsylvania, originally, right outside of Philly. It's a very blighted area right now. The kids are dying. Someone's getting killed every day. What you mentioned about having a mentor, I'd like you to please share, are there resources within your circle, within the hip hop community, within (laughs) film, that can give hope to the children from my community and other neighborhoods to tell their story in film? You know, you you reminded me of something that uh, happened to me. I grew up in Brooklyn, Brownsville, and you know, home of Mike Tyson, and, and, and it was just a tough, tough neighborhood. But one thing that used to, they did was they had a community center, and every Wednesday, they would invite the kids in and show them films. And we so, and we was we saw you know all kind of films, Bird on the Wire, uh, uh, Mr. Mean, uh, Charles Bronson films, and even martial art films. Um, Films have that power. Even the most unruly kid, you know, the problem is the kind of films they probably expose themselves to. So I would advise to you, if you could, um, to, you know, start a film club where you're bringing kids in and you're showing them films, films that show the results of their action. Look, we all love Scarface, right? but he died at the end of the film. (laughs) That's the results of what happens. You know what I mean? Juice, you know, but we could go through our list. The one thing, what I do with my own children, you know, I show them films as education. When Liam Nelson made the film, The Gray, 
I was so inspired by the idea of him questioning God throughout that film. And at the end of the day, he just tied the glass around his fist and was like, yo, okay, I got to do this myself. You know what I mean? Because the power is given to us to do it ourselves. And I let my son watch that, and he caught that same idea, yo. And he started jogging more. So film really have the power. Choose a nice list of films for yourself and gradually guide your community with that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, Riza. Uh I guess I'll, I'll echo what everyone else has said. You've been a huge inspiration. In 97, a group of my friends, we skipped school. We were 14 to go wait in line and buy Wu-Tang forever because we knew if we had the double LP, we wouldn't need no education. So thank you for that. <laughs> Two of those friends died, and it was a day to God is a thousand years that showed me the true joy of love just through a thousand tears. So thank you. But anyways, I'm up here. There, outside, there was a guy. His name is Sean. He's right in front of you with the beard. He's got an original precedent of Only Built for Cuban Links, and he's an Iraq war veteran, and he suffers from PTSD. He couldn't get up here and talk. For, so I'm talking for him. It would mean the world to him if you sign that maybe after this is over. Uh, he was talking about it all out there, and so I just thought I'd take the time to, to speak for him and ask you to sign that for him. It'd be my I'm pleasure. Out. Peace be with you. Thank you so much. Peace. Thanks, brother. Thank you, brother. I can do that now. Come on up. I'm going to knock that out. Thank you, sir. You know, I, was, I know that we were talking about film. Well, actually, one of the biggest films uh, this this year so far, American Sniper. I want to thank this gentleman for serving his time uh, in the military. Something that I think, I just want to just take a quick minute because sometimes we, uh, we chilling, yo. You know what I mean? For real. We're going to leave here chilling. You're going to go to the store, get your food, your sushi, your, your steak, whatever. You chilling. You know what I mean? That's because somebody else is sacrificed. You know what I mean? I'm not a man about war, I'm a man of peace, but I definitely got to still respect the, the privileges that come to us through the service of other men. I mean, don't never, never downplay that because it's, it's uh, you know, it's, 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 it's double-edged, but it's something that we got to appreciate. So I just want to uh, applaud this military man right here for uh, serving for us, bro. Thank you. Uh, this side? Yo, Reza. Um, I'm Russell. I come from Durban, South Africa. Um, it took us about 20 hours to get here. Um, I, in 93, when your cats dropped, they entered 36 chambers. It was my first year in school. I picked up the Wu Tang collection in 2003, thereabout. And what struck me was how these men in Staten Island and Brooklyn were able to articulate my reality. About 20, 10, 10, 15 years later, better than I could ever articulate my reality as a black kid. Um, my worldview was informed by the Wu-Tang, by nonfiction and Jada Mind Tricks and Cannibal Ox and the likes. And as I realized that, that hip hop was just, just one way in which one can express themselves and now I'm working with with various disciplines of arts, literature, film, music, fine arts, contemporary, whatever, I find myself going back and finding those references and those sources in hip hop, in Wu Tang specifically. So I want to thank you on behalf of my friends, and this dude right here is taking pictures for inspiring us, for helping us find ourselves and understand our place in the wider spectrum of things. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. There's, a, there's a form of energy that's called resonance. And I mean, things resonate. And uh, sometimes what's happening somewhere else is happening here, you know? Sometimes what we're living through now, you're going to live through later. And uh, it's an artist's job, you know? It's an artist's job, you know? When, when, when Michelangelo painted 
the Chapel or Da Vinci or when they when they did their work, they left for us signs, ideas, images of their time. And then their time inspires our time. So as an artist, filmmaker, music composer, writer, you know, that's a gift that's inherent in you that means a lot to the world. I did an equation recently. I was like, yo, if you, let's just say that there's only, uh, let's just use a big number. Let's say there's 10 million artists on the planet. And out of those 10 million, let's say 1 million is good. All right? If you take that 1 million and you divide it into the 7 billion, you lose it. And that's how rare being an artist is. All right, so keep it alive, y'all. I think we can take one more question because uh, our time is running. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm trying to be like a, an actor, a comedian, director, writer, anything that, that, that a film can, can get me into. Um, I'm really trying to be a jack of all trades. So I, I understand you are because you're Wu-Tang and you've acted, you've directed, all this awesome stuff. Um, so how do I do... Um, as many of those kinds of things as I can without being mediocre in each and being a master of each trade? Master one trade first. <laughs> when you master one trade, all other things become more easier. Thank you. Let me take this young guy before we go. This young kid right here. Uh, so I'm in high school and... <laughs> You're supposed to be in school today, kid. No. <laughs> nah, nah. It's spring break. And me and my friend, uh, Indigo, we don't really like new rap, but we like old rap. And uh, I just wanted to say that you and all of Wu-Tang have just inspired us to do so many good things. It's like better than most of the new rap right now. And I think that most kids should look into it. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. I want to thank uh, South by Southwest. I want to thank everybody for taking the time uh, for coming out. And uh, I hope that this time we spent together was useful time. And I hope it multiplies. I hope I put a few seeds in you. You definitely put a few seeds back in me. And may they grow. And may they spread out the great branches. Peace and blessings. Where's the Wu-Tang forever? Bong, bong. In 1865, we had the shot. Like, war's over. Let's, like, get rid of the slavery business and the racism business. 13th Amendment, great, no slavery. 14th Amendment, my personal favorite, uh, equal rights for everyone. 15th Amendment, a, a 16, uh, 1870. Uh, men of color can vote. Women had to wait a while. 